It is a joy for us to be able to look into the Word of God together again this morning. And as we consider the times that we live in, if we read a newspaper or news on the internet, we know that these are very important days that we are living in. And we want to consider what we are to do in these days from a message entitled, Build the Ark, Build the Church. How building the Ark of Noah was prophetic of the church that Jesus Christ is building today. Now, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, our Lord Jesus said, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Nanganak ng tao or di Cristo. At his coming, it will be like the days of Noah. And so we want to first look at some of the similarities between the time of Noah and today. Next. First, we want to look in Genesis. If you want to open your Bibles, we will look at a little of the story of Noah and the ark. And in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it says about the days of Noah, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So the first thing we see about the times of Noah was the growing corruption, the growing sinfulness of all of mankind. And again, you don't need to read much news to know how, how uh, evil is now being called good. And what is good is being called evil. How there is growing corruption and sinfulness in the world. But because of that, in Genesis chapter 3, or chapter 6, verse 13, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. As the Lord was sorry that he had made mankind, the earth was filled with violence. There was wars, rumors of wars, murder, just, just evil everywhere. God decided that he would send judgment, okay? Ang paghatol ng Dios ay malapit na. And so, as judgment was warned, we also read in the next verse, God spoke to Noah, verse 14. Make yourself an ark, isang barko, an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And so, while God warned that judgment was coming, he also said that a place of protection was to be prepared. Now, in Noah's day, it was the ark that protected Noah's family and anyone who would believe in those days, so that they would be able to with protection, go through the flood, go through the judgment, and come into the new world of peace. That happened in Noah's day. But in the same way, in our day, the Lord is building a church that will overcome the difficulties of the last days. And we can go through tribulation, ang mga kahirapan, sa itong panahon. And arrive safely in the new age, ang millennial, the new age of the kingdom of Christ. Pagkatapos ang ikalawang pagdating ni Cristo, the new age, ang bagong panahon ni Cristo, para sa ang buong lupa, as he rules the world as king of kings. Sinabi ni Jesus sa Mateo chapter 16, verse 18, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Itatayo ko ang aking eklesia 
At ang mga pintuan ng hadis ay hindi magtatagumpay laban sa kanya. Christ's church is being built in our days, a place of protection, a place of victory. Do you need protection? Do we need victory? Do we need to be ready for to see Christ's protection and blessing upon us in these days? Yes, and we will need to see it more and more in these last days. And so as the Lord spoke to Noah that he was to build an ark, a place of protection, Jesus promised he will build a triumphant church. Now, back in Genesis chapter 6, verse 14, the Lord had told Noah, make an ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. Alkitran, or pitch. Parang for, for boats today, uh, they will use epoxy to waterproof the cracks between the pieces of wood or, or the pieces of the boat. And they didn't have epoxy back in those days. They used pitch. But the word sa Hebreo para sa pitch was atonement or covering. It was the same word used in the Bible to speak of a covering for sin. And so between all of the crooked pieces of wood in the boat, they were to cover it. They were to waterproof it, to make it secure with pitch. But for us, we have a much better uh, waterproofing. We have a much better protection than pitch or epoxy. It is the blood of Jesus that now is to protect and waterproof, we could say, the church of Jesus Christ. Because we are all like pieces of wood being built together to make a boat, to make a place of protection. And we are hindi perfecto. We have our problems, our weaknesses, and Christians will be crooked. And you put two pieces of wood together that are crooked, and water can go inside and can make a boat sink. You take two Christians and put them together, and there will be places that they don't, they don't fit, and there's cracks. And the judgment of God, the flood could come in, except that the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. And when we forgive our brothers, our sisters, when we seek for the forgiveness of Christ, then the church becomes a place that is waterproof, leak-proof, sink-proof. The water can't get in. The boat can't sink if it is properly pitched or waterproofed or covered by the blood of Christ. That was the word used about the pitch, the waterproofing for Noah's Ark. It was to be an atonement, a covering, a protection for us, the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, in Genesis 6.16, Noah was told, you shall make a window for the ark. That's one of the first things he was told. And this window for the ark, it says, was to be above. Only one window mentioned, probably a very long window just below the roof. And this one window that was above, looked above, speaks to us that we, in the church, we need to always be looking above. One window, one vision. Jesus said, if your eye is single, we can be full of light. If our vision is focused, and how is our vision to be focused? Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 3 tells us, Set your affection on things above, not on the things of the earth. We need our vision to be focused above, not on the things below. What would happen if you made a boat and you put a window in the bottom of the boat? Huh? 
You put a window in the bottom of the boat, and what happens? Glug, 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 glug. You're going to sink. What happens in these last days with the difficulties in the world around us? What happens if we're looking at all of the problems? Glug, 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 glug. We start to sink. Like when Peter saw the wind in the waves. When Peter took his eyes off of Jesus, he began to sink. We need to keep our eyes looking above to Christ, to his promises, to the things that are to come. There was a man in church history that endured some of the greatest difficulties of anyone in world history. His name was Martin Luther. He began the Protestant Reformation. At his time, the traditional church of Europe was full of false doctrine and uh, holy wars and uh, uh, pay money to buy a piece of paper and your sins will be forgiven, uh, all kinds of wrong things. And when Martin Luther began to uh, preach the Bible and bring people back to the word of God, back to the Lord, he had great difficulties. He was condemned to death. He was, uh, had uh, the threats of, of armies against him. And once he was summoned by the emperor to appear before the emperor and a group of, uh, of church leaders to be tried for heresy, and Martin Luther wanted to go to declare the truths of the Word of God, to, to discuss uh, Bible doctrine. And his disciples said, Martin Luther, don't go to discuss uh, Bible doctrine with them. There was a man, John Hus, who, who they said they would give peace and protection to, to discuss Bible doctrine. And he went, they locked him up in prison and then burned him. To death. They didn't give him a chance to discuss the Bible. Martin, don't go to the emperor. They'll arrest you. They'll kill you. And Martin Luther said, I am ready to go to the city where the emperor is. I am ready to teach the Bible. I'm ready to go to that city even if on every rooftop of every building there is sitting a demon. Now, how many roof tiles are on a building? <laughs> Marami. How many buildings in the city? Marami pa. And he said, even if there's a demon on each one, I will go there to preach the gospel. Very bold at times. He went and he stood and they, and they, and they told him to repent. And before the emperor and before the religious leaders, he said, I am bound to the word of God. If you can convince me from the Bible my teachings are wrong, I will renounce them. But I am standing on the word of God. I cannot repent for the truth. And so they did put a death sentence on him. He had many difficulties and he could rise in faith at times, but there were other times when Martin Luther became very discouraged with all the dangers, all the death threats, all the difficulties. And one morning he was very discouraged and depressed, and his wife came down from the bedroom on the second floor. She walked down the stairs, and Martin Luther looked at her. She was all dressed in black. She had on funeral clothes. And Martin Luther said to her, oh, did somebody die? Are we going to a funeral? I didn't hear about this. And his wife said to him, Martin Luther, I am wearing these funeral clothes because you are acting like God has died. Is your problems bigger than God? And he got the idea. And he decided, don't look at the problems. God has not died. Many follow someone that will grow old and die. We follow the one who died and rose again and lives forever to be our Savior. 
and our coming king. Hallelujah. Amen. And so Martin Luther said, whenever he looked at his problems, he did not see how he could succeed. He had a lot of difficulties. And when he looked down at the problems, he felt he would be a failure. He said, but when I look up, when I look up at Christ and the promises of God, I do not see how I can fail. So it depends. Are we looking on the window above to heaven, to Jesus, to his promises? Then we will be part of the victorious church. Are we looking down? Is your window on the bottom of your boat? Glug, 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 glug. The boat's going to sink. No, Christ is building a church that will look up. He said, when you see all of these difficulties coming in the world, look up for your salvation is drawing near. So we should be doing a lot of looking up these days. Amen. Not just reading the newspaper, watching the news. Oh, the problems, the wars, rumors of war. No, look up at our coming king. Now, in Genesis 6.16, it further says God commanded Moses to build this boat that would have one door on the side. Okay? Isang pinto sa gilid. And... That is the same as in the church. The church has one door. Sinabi ni Jesus sa Juan, Capitulo 10, versículo 9, He said, I am the door. If any man will come in through me, he will be saved. One door into victory. One door to salvation and protection in these last days. One door, one Savior, one way. There was a man who lived 2,600 years ago. His name was Gotama. He was the son of a wealthy king. And he was going to inherit his father's wealth and kingdom. But as a young man, he went out into the kingdom and saw poverty, saw suffering, and it touched his heart. And he decided to renounce the, the wealth and pleasures of the palace. And he became a wandering seeker for truth that wanted to find how can we overcome uh, difficulties and sorrow and suffering. And as he tried to learn how to overcome suffering, renounce the world, he started to gather followers. And his followers began to call him the Enlightened One, the Buddha. So his name from birth was Gotama. His disciples called him Gotama the Buddha. But when Gotama was near death, he called his disciples and he told them, I have sought for the truth, but I am dying now. After I die, make sure you do not worship me. I am only a seeker. So, what happened after he died? Asia is full of idols of Buddha. And his disciples are not following his example. He said he was not worthy. He was not God. There was another great religious leader that rose up about 1,400 years ago. When he was a young man, he had epilepsy, epileptic fits. And his relatives wondered if he was demon-possessed. This is in history. But as he started to declare different things and be spiritual, uh, Many people decide, decide, oh, maybe he's not demon-possessed. Maybe it is the Spirit of God. And they started to gather around him. He gathered an army that followed Muhammad in conquering again and again and again. But 
Muhammad said, and it is written in the Quran in many places, he said that he prayed for the forgiveness of his sins. Muhammad knew he was a sinner. But he also wrote in the Quran that Jesus was sinless. Muhammad confessed his sins. He said, Jesus is sinless. Now, many people follow the prophet Muhammad. But we follow the prophet Jesus and one greater than the prophet. But which prophet do you want to follow? The sinful one? Or the sinless one. That's what the Quran teaches. And the Bible teaches much more that Christ is more than a prophet. He is the coming king. He is the one who died but rose again. He is the one door to salvation. And so we celebrate Easter. The empty tomb of Christ that showed that he rose again is our open door to salvation. And as we celebrate Palm Sunday today, we remember how the week before Christ died for our sins, he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. And in ancient history, if a king or a general or a ruler rode into a city on a donkey, it signified he was coming in peace. A donkey was an animal of labor, of work, not an animal of war. If a general or a king came in on a horse, that was a symbol of war, of victory, of an army coming to conquer. But Jesus came meek and humble into Jerusalem as a savior. He came in on a donkey. Saang unang pagdating ni Cristo. Pero sa ang ikalawang pagdating ni Cristo, Jesus will not be riding on a donkey. We can read in Revelation chapter 19 that John saw heaven open and behold, one on a white horse was riding with the armies of heaven coming down to the earth. And his name was the King of kings and the Lord of lords who was going to destroy all sin from the world in flaming fire. When Jesus comes again, it will not be on a donkey in peace. He is coming back as the king of kings to judge the world. And so we want to make sure we have entered the door of salvation. For everyone listening to this message, do you know you have asked Christ to be your Savior? Do you know for sure you have gone through the door into the church? You are a Christian, Satunai. You believe in Jesus. You have asked for forgiveness of sin. You are seeking to follow the Lord. There is only one door, and it is open today if we will turn from our sins and turn to Jesus Christ. So there was one window looking above in Noah's Ark. There was one door to enter in to protection. And then we also can read the dimensions of the Ark in Genesis chapter 6, verse 15. And so, in chapter 6 and verse 15, the Lord told Noah how to build the ark. He said, this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits long. Its width will be 50 cubits wide. And its height will be 30 cubits high. God gave the blueprint. He gave the plan for building a boat that would give protection for all who would enter the door, that would be safe from the coming judgment of God. Now, these three numbers, 350 and 30, uh, in the Bible, numbers often have spiritual significance, a spiritual meaning. 
Alimbawa, the number 12. The number 12 in the Bible speaks of government. So in the Old Testament, we find the Jews were governed by 12 tribes. In the New Testament, we read the early church was governed by 12 apostles. You look on a clock and you see the night and day is governed by 12 hours. You look on a calendar and you see the year is governed by 12 months. You look on a keyboard and you see all music is governed by 12 notes, 12 keys. Because 12 has a number, is a number of significance. It's a biblia, a, it's a creation in this world. It is a number of government. But what does 300 mean? Okay, well, we can look back in Genesis chapter 5 for the first time that 300 is spoken in the Bible. And there is a law of Bible study that says that the first time a word is mentioned in the Bible, it is often prophetic or it shows the meaning of that word. It is like a seed that will grow and that its meaning will grow through the rest of the Bible from the first time we see a word in the Bible. And the first time we see the word 300 in the Bible is in Genesis 5.22, where it says that after his son Methuselah was born, Enoch walked with God 300 years. Okay, so the meaning of the word 300 in the Bible is tied to walking with God. Later in the book of Judges, we read that, that uh, Gideon and his small select group of soldiers, only 300, they walked with God. They were led by the Spirit, and those 300 had victory over a huge army. But we need to learn to walk with God if we want to be part of the victorious, triumphant church. Now we read in the verse before that, Methu that Enoch lived 65 years and then had his son Methuselah. And when he had his son, he started walking with God for 300 years. Why did Enoch just start to walk with God? He was already 65. Why did he start then? Well, the Bible says that Enoch was a prophet, and Enoch named his son Methuselah, which can be translated, after his death, the flood is coming. Now, if you had a baby born, your son or daughter, and God told you, name them, when they die, the world will be destroyed. Yikes. We'd start doing some thinking. When they die, it's the end of the world. The flood is coming, the judgment. And so Enoch started walking with God when he heard that the judgment of God is soon coming. And if we read our Bibles and we see how in the last days there will be wars, rumors of wars, there will be uh, plagues, there will be pandemics, there will be... Uh, there will be uh, hunger. There will be rising prices of food, the Bible says in the book of Revelation. When we see that these things are coming to pass, that should encourage us. It is more important than ever that each of us learns how to walk with God. Because if we walk with God, we will be part of that victorious church, we will be building, not the ark, we will be building the victorious church. So I can remember when I was a young minister and I was holding services on Saturdays at a high security prison in Jackson, Michigan, and would go there on Saturdays, would have to go through three sets of security, three, uh, three doors and, 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 and 
and be tested for metal. And, and then I would go in to this high security prison that was just for murderers and for very evil people. And we had services there and people got saved and grew in God. But a time came when I felt in my spirit, oh, next Saturday, something's wrong. Something's not good. I kept praying and I felt I should not hold the service here. I was the leader, but I felt I should cancel the service. And as I was praying, I, I said to some people, I, I just feel like I should cancel the service. I feel like we will have no more services there. So natural, I had no idea why I was thinking this. But as I was seeking to walk with God, God was warning me. It's the end of that prison ministry. So that Saturday morning, I did not go through the three uh, doors of security, and, and I was not there with the prisoners. But the same time we would have held the service, that Saturday, there was a large riot inside the prison. And the prisoners took guards and people inside hostage. And if I was there, <laughs> I probably would have been one of them. And they burned down some of the buildings, and their riot was so bad that the government closed down that prison. Many millions of dollars to build it. They closed it down forever. And the services did stop there. Salvation was proclaimed. People were having an opportunity to meet with God. And then the end came. And we need to know we are living in days when salvation is offered, when, when things can be safe, but dangerous, more dangerous times are coming. When my family and I moved down to southern Palawan in 1983, we moved down to the south to an area the military had withdrawn. The military had retreated, and the area we lived in was ruled by Muslim rebels. And they would come to the Bible school. They would come to our house. And we prayed because they kidnapped the internationals to the north of us. They kidnapped the internationals to the south of us. We were the only ones left. But God led us there. And for the year and a half we were there, God protected us there. When we left, less than an hour after we left, there was a shootout. The military came in and fought the rebels just near where we had lived. And a general came and told us later, don't go back there. You can't go back. It's not safe. But we already felt we should relocate up to Port of Princesa. God was leading us by his spirit. And in these last days, we will want more and more to be led by the Holy Spirit. Because as we walk with God, there will be protection. We will be part of the victorious church that Jesus is building in these last days. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Jesus said, do you want to be part of that victorious church? Amen? Then let's Walk with God, 300 cubits long. Now, the way that you commonly measure something that's long is you walk. One step, two steps, three steps. And a cubit, 300 cubits, sub Biblia, is about 300 footsteps. So you measure how long something is by your walk, by your footsteps. But the way that you often measure how wide something is, is with your arms with your hands and your arms someone says oh the fish was this big okay or when we were building our bible school i would go around and i would uh, put my hands out at the sides of a door and then i would go and i would measure somewhere else is that wide enough and i would go around people saw me walking around sometimes like this uh, it was just you know to measure something we can measure how wide something is by our arms stretched out. 
you measure a walk by, or you measure how long something is by your walk. You measure how wide something is by your outreach. And the church is to have an outreach. We are to reach out like the number 50. Because 50 is the number in the Bible that has two spiritual significances. The number 50 speaks of jubilee. In Revelation 20, or, or, excuse me, Leviticus 25.10, the Bible says, every 50 years, you will have a jubilee, you will have a celebration, you will proclaim liberty. Every 50 years, every slave was to be set free. Every piece of land that had been sold was to return back to the, to the proper owners, to the family who had owned that land for generations. 50 was a number of deliverance, of victory every 50 years. For us, we are to be able to reach out with the message of liberty, of deliverance. We have a gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of forgiveness of sins, of healing for our souls, healing for our bodies, help for our needs. There is a jubilee that we can reach out and give to the needy people of this world, that they can come in and be saved, that they can be part of the victorious church with us. But even as we reach out with the message of 50 jubilee, of liberty, we also read a second meaning in the Bible of 50 was Pentecost. Penta, mulas griego, it means 50th, every 50. And so 50 days after their feast of Passover, they had a second feast, ang ikalong pista ng Pentecoste. And on the day of Pentecost, that is when the power of the Holy Spirit came on the first disciples. And the church had its birthday in power. When the Holy Spirit came and they spoke in tongues and, and Peter preached with power and 3,000 were saved. We need in our lives the message of jubilee, of freedom, of liberty. We are happy Christians. Our sins are forgiven. We are on the highway to heaven. There is the door of salvation. We have protection. We have a good shepherd. We have a message of jubilee. If we are Christians, Satunai, and we are to seek for the power of the Holy Spirit. Because the power of the Holy Spirit will give, uh, will give victory also, will give us triumph, will make the gospel of Jesus come in power. I can remember a time when I was fasting and praying for some days at uh, uh, the church of a friend of mine in Niagara Falls. And there was, uh, after an evening of praying, I had prayed for hours. I just felt the presence of God in such power. I left the private place of prayer, and I walked into the church, into a room, with a person. That person was a very evil sinner. He had beaten up his parents, their faces, until there was blood on his hands. But when I came into the room with the power of the Holy Spirit on me, with the presence of God touched his heart, and he started to say, Jesus, save me! Jesus, save me! When we have the anointing of the Holy Spirit in our lives, then the word of God goes forward with power. People's lives will be touched. They'll say, oh, what's different about you? you you're di why, why are you happy? Why? And, and we can tell them, we are Christians. 
Jesus is my Savior. I know I have been given eternal life. I am in the ark. I am part of the triumphant church. I do not fear the last days. When the storms come, Jesus will still be my Lord and Savior. Amen? And so, we need to, how long do we build the church? We walk with God. How do we reach out and build the church? With the message of liberty by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jubilee and Pentecost. And so, the more we have 50 in our lives, the more we will be building the victorious church. Once I went to the province of Rajasthan in western India, and I conducted a, a seminar for several hundred pastors, and I was very interested in going there because I knew 20 years before that time, there were no Christians in that part of India. But when I went, there were hundreds of pastors and many churches. So I asked them, why are there so many Christians in this uh, province of Rajasthan, in your area? And they told me the story that 20 years before, an evangelist had come to their people. They were a tribal people, a people that were very poor, no education. They could not read or write. But this evangelist came and preached the gospel. And they, 12 of them about believed and turned to Christ. And he discipled them for some days. And before he left, he, he could not give them a Bible. Nobody could read. But before he left, he gave them one command. He said, pray for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so these new Christians, uneducated, they knew Jesus is their Savior, and they knew pray for the coming of the Holy Spirit. So every day, they gathered, and they prayed and prayed and prayed. Come, Holy Spirit, come. And the power of God started to be revealed. And the next days, they kept praying. Come, Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. They kept praying for the coming of the Holy Spirit. The power of God grew stronger upon them. They began to cast out demons and heal the sick. They kept praying for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And they began to raise people from the dead. And at this seminar, after they told me this story, they looked around and they called for three pastors to introduce to me. And they said, this pastor, he has about 500 members. In it. This pastor, he has about 1,000 members. This pastor, he has about 1,500. And then they told me, but what is similar for all three of them is they all dedicated their lives to serve God when the Christians prayed for them after they died and they rose from the dead and they dedicated themselves to become pastors. And so they kept praying for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Are we still praying for more of the Holy Spirit? Or do we say, oh, tamana. okay? No, let's be hungry for more of God. Let's pray that God builds Pentecost into the Pentecostals, Satunai. Amen? So don't stop praying. No, build the victorious church. Now, as we measure a distance by walking to build the victorious church, we are to walk with God. As we measure how wide something is by how we reach out, we are to reach out with the message of jubilee, of, of liberty, and the message of Pentecost by the power of the Holy Spirit. But then we also read that they were to build the ark 30 cubits high. And 30 in the Bible also has significance. Now, we commonly measure how high something is by our own body, by our own stature. And somebody might say, oh, I went in the river and it was knee high. Someone else might say, 
oh, well, you know, the table is, is, is this high on my waist. Someone else might say, oh, the Marikina River flooded. Oh, and the water rose up to here in my house. Okay. We often measure things by our own body, by our own height of maturity. And the number 30 in the Bible, how high are we to be? Well, 30 in the Bible speaks about coming to full height, full spiritual maturity. Because Jesus began his ministry at age 30. John the Baptist began to preach at the age 30. David became king at 30. Joseph began to rule as the second in command of Egypt at the age 30. The Levites in the Old Testament, they were to enter their full ministry age 30. 30 has a significance. Come to full maturity, full ministry, full victory. And so, how are we growing in God? Are we coming into full maturity? In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, the Apostle Paul teaches us. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. The Apostle Paul taught that we are to no longer remain children, tossed back and forth by every wind of doctrine, by the deceits of men. Children are easily deceived. You tell a child, oh, your tooth came out? Oh, put it under the pillow. The tooth fairy will come and give you money. Oh, you better not cry. You better not shout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming. To okay? Children are easily deceived. But if we are spiritual children, we can be easily deceived also. And people can teach the Bible wrong. And they can say, oh, the grace of God forgives our sin in the past, in the present. Our sin in the future is forgiven. So go ahead and sin. Enjoy sin. It will be forgiven. That is not true Christianity. The grace of God teaches us how to learn to overcome sin, not enjoy it. Because sin will always lead to sorrow and suffering, and to death. Maybe pleasure for a day, but sorrow will come. And so, there are wrong doctrines that spiritual, immature Christians can be deceived with. There can be false miracles where people are running after, oh, we heard there's gold dust over there. And there was an evangelist that was caught once this lady evangelist had put little capsules in her hairdo with little flakes of plastic that were gold-colored. And when she prayed for people and shook her head, then little gold flakes came down from her head until they found where she was hiding the fake gold dust. Okay? There are lying miracles. There are those that deceive. And... There are not just people that deceive. There are deceiving spirits that want to confuse and lead young Christians in wrong directions. The first time I went to Guatemala in 1979, I was staying at the house of a missionary friend, and he took me one afternoon to a very old ruin of a cathedral. And he took me to this ruined cathedral, and he took me to a wall. Many people were there at the wall. They were praying, and they were taking pictures, little photographs of someone that was sick, and they would stick these pictures with a thumbtack. They would stick them on this wall. The cathedral wall was stone or cement, but this one place was wood, and so they stuck these pictures there, and my friend told me, this is the casket, the grave of 
a priest from many years before. And people said he was a holy priest and he had miracle powers and that he healed the sick. So people bring the picture here of their sick one. They stick it there on the coffin and then, then they knock on the wood of the coffin so that the dead priest inside will hear their prayer. Okay. Now, for my friend and I, <laughs> oh, poor people, we laughed. We thought that was so ridiculous, so, so false. That night, I was at my friend's house, very far away, and that night, a spirit came to visit me. And I wondered, is this an angel of the Lord? And this spirit be began to speak many spiritual things. But the more he spoke, to, I could not see his form. He was just, I knew he was there. I could hear his voice. And he was speaking, oh, spiritual things. But in my heart, I did not feel good. And so I felt, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. And that spirit left. Afterwards, I thought, why did an evil spirit come to talk to me and try to be my friend? And tell me spiritual. So I prayed, Lord, oh, why? What happened? And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. In the afternoon, you went to visit where that evil spirit lives at the coffin of in the old broken down cathedral. You went to visit where he lived in the afternoon. So tonight, he came to visit where you are living. Yay! Don't invite evil spirits to visit your house, okay? I learned a lesson. Be careful about going to places that are filled with evil spirits. And so we need to be careful that we do not remain little children confused by deceiving things. There are Christians, there are Pentecostals that teach, oh, the angels will come down from heaven, the saints will come down, uh, uh, just pray, Jeremiah will come down and teach you, and, and John the Baptist will visit you. But those things can be evil spirits that visit you. So we need to be careful that we are growing spiritually, to be mature, to be careful and discerning. Grow up in God that we will no longer be little children deceived by wrong doctrines, by false spirits. So we are to learn to walk with God. We are to learn to reach out with liberty and the power of the Holy Spirit and we need to grow in God and become spiritually mature so that we are growing to be part of the victorious church Jesus is building in our days. The Lord wants to build these spiritual dimensions into our lives and church so we can overcome the judgments of the last days. The ark was the right dimensions. Once there was a, a British man who designed large boats, and he said, oh, the 300 by 50 by 30, that is perfect dimensions for a strong, safe boat. He said, that's, that's, that's perfect to build a large boat. Well, Noah didn't know it was perfect, but God did. Okay, and how will we know to build a victorious church? Well, we might not know, but God knows. We're to walk with God, reach out with the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit, and we need to seek to grow to spiritual maturity, to become fathers and mothers, spiritu, in the body of Christ, so that we, like the triumphant ark, will be part of a triumphant church. Now, in Noah's day, there were probably many boats. There was multitudes of people, and they probably had fishing boats, and they had merchant boats, and all kinds of boats. But all of the other boats sank when the great flood came. 
None of them were the right size, were the right shape. None of them were prepared for the great flood that was coming. All the other boats sank. And so, in our day, we want to be careful to be building our church, building our lives the right way so that our church will go through the judgments and the troubles that are around, that we will prepare properly to build and with Christ see the victorious church built in your life, in your family, in MZCF. In Noah's time, there were businessmen busy with earning money. There were people getting married and enjoying life. But in Sapanahon ni Noe, isalaman ang mahalagang gawin. Okay? The only thing that was important in Noah's day was to build the ark. Build the place of protection. Everything else had some use. There's some value to build a business. There's some value to do this and that. But the only thing of lasting importance in Noah's day was build the ark. And when we look at our lives and our priorities, the only thing of lasting value is that we build in our lives, we build MZCF to be a people that learn to walk with God, that reach out with the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit, and we grow in God to spiritual maturity so that we will be a church that the gates of hell will not overcome. We will win. We read at the end of the Bible, it's the church that is triumphant, not the devil. It is Christ who wins. And we who follow him fully will, will share in his victory. Now, after the flood, after Noah and his family, those who believed were protected, when the flood was gone, when they stepped out of the ark, they entered into a new world. All the violent, sinful people were gone. Only the righteous remained. It was a new world of peace, righteousness, joy. The whole world was theirs in peace and prosperity. And after the judgments of these last days, pagkatapos ang ikalawang pagdating ni Cristo, we will have a world of righteousness, peace, and joy. And so that is our vision. That's the one window. We're looking for the coming of Christ and his kingdom, and through his victory, we can each be a part of it. But we need to build. We need to prepare. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Jesus is coming soon. Get ready, because there will be a new age, a new world for you and for me as we fully follow Christ. So let us together be dedicated to help build the church that will become like Noah's Ark, a church that will have victory over the gates of hell, a church that will bring us safely through all of the troubles that are going to get worse. We're going to have more difficulties in the world in these last days. But we have a Christ to protect us, and we have the body of Christ that will see victory in these last days. And so let's build together, brothers and sisters. Let's walk with God and find his protection. Let's reach out and invite many to join us in the church of safety and salvation. And let's rise up in God to become spiritually mature and be ready for the second coming of Christ and his coming worldwide kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy. We're not building an ark in our day. 
but Christ is building a victorious church. So let's rejoice in what Christ is doing, and let's make sure we are a full part of what he is doing. Amen? And so, if I could invite the music team, pastors, let's continue our service and remember this teaching. As in the days of Noah, let us get ready and build the triumphant church. Thank you. God bless you.